Alrighty, hello everybody. In this video, we're going to be discussing receptor tyrosine kinases. And if you recall from our previous videos, we've looked at enzymes that are controlled by covalent modification. And one example was serine and threonine kinases. Serine threonine kinases are enzymes that are responsible for the phosphorylation of specific serine and threonine residues. Okay, well another example is the phosphorylation of tyrosine residues by proteins known as protein tyrosine kinases, right? Okay, protein tyrosine kinases or PTKs, right? In the human genome, it encodes about 90 different protein tyrosine kinases about 90 different protein tyrosine kinases and about 388 different serine threonine kinases. So if you think about it, that's about, they play an important role in um, the phosphorylation of about one third of the protein in the human cell, right? Well, protein tyrosine kinases are, play a major role in intracellular signaling systems. And we're going to take a look at how a given ligand can bind to its receptor tyrosine kinase, which will trigger um, the protein tyrosine kinase activity of that receptor, which will phosphorylate a number of different proteins, um, creating an entire signaling cascade. So in this video, we'll focus on receptor tyrosine kinases, but we'll specifically focus on the insulin receptor. But in general, those receptor tyrosine kinases um, are embedded within the membrane. They have a single transmembrane segment. They're typically monomers, right, in the absence of a ligand. And the binding of a ligand to the receptor triggers dimerization of the receptor. And then the receptor itself becomes activated. Once the receptor is activated, what will happen is that it will activate its protein tyrosine kinase activity, which is typically within the C-terminal domain of that um, receptor, and it is found in the cytoplasmic end of the membrane. Once it's activated, it will autophosphorylate um, specific tyrosine residues within the protein, within the receptor, okay? And then in turn, once it's activated, it can now phosphorylate other protein substrates. And that's what's gonna create an entire signaling cascade. So let's take a look at an example that something important to keep about those protein tyrosine kinases is it is an ATP-dependent phosphorylation. An ATP-dependent phosphorylation of tyrosine, right? Of specific tyrosine residues, right? Not all tyrosine, specific tyrosine residues. So if you think about um, this being a protein backbone and then um, we have a tyrosine, right? It does require ATP to be, to bind to that protein tyrosine kinase or the receptor that exhibits a protein tyrosine kinase activity. That ATP is converted into ADP and then it is phosphorylated, right? So it's ATP-dependent phosphorylation of tyrosine, right? Autophosphorylation doesn't require ATP, but activating the other protein tyrosine kinase will require the phosphorylation of tyrosine um, that is ATP-dependent. All right, so let's take a look at the insulin receptor. Well, we said that the receptors are typically monomers and dimerize upon 
ligand binding? Well, the insulin receptor is an exception in that it is an alpha beta protomer or an alpha 2 beta 2 heterotetramer. It does dimerize once the ligand is bound, but on its own, it is an alpha beta protomer, right? Um, it's composed, or really, it's protocl proteolytically cleaved from a 138 residue precursor peptide, and then it has the alpha and the beta subunit. The beta subunit is entirely, or is embedded within the membrane, whereas the alpha subunit is entirely in the extracellular space. Okay. The protein tyrosine kinase activity is within the cytoplasmic end of the membrane. Now the alpha and the beta subunit are linked via a disulfide bond. And then the alpha subunit of either, either one of the two alpha subunits is also further linked by a disulfide bond. Okay, so what happens is that the ligand is gonna bind from the extracellular phase of that membrane and once it binds, there's actually two insulin um, molecules that will bind to the poly or to the receptor. Once it binds, it's going to trigger dimerization of the receptor, and that's because it will, you know, x ray shows that it will sh have this V shape within its alpha subunit, which will bring the two beta subunits from the cytoplasmic end closer and closer proximity to one another. They'll phosphorylate. The image shows two um, phosphorylated tyrosine residues. It's really three phosphorylated tyrosine residues on each end. And just coming in close proximity will auto-phosphorylate. So it is an auto-phosphorylation that is triggered by ligand binding, which triggers dimerization of um, the receptors. Okay. So now let's take a look at the protein tyrosine kinase activity, which is, again, we said right within the cytoplasm. Right? So the X structure of that beta subunit that has the tyrosine kinase activity and we're looking at it um, we're looking really at the insulin receptor the end terminal domain is really mainly composed of beta sheets which is up here shown in purple and a single alpha helix whereas the C terminal domain is mainly really alpha helical now there is a segment within the protein tyrosine kinase that has tyrosine residues that will autophosphorylate. And those are really shown in a loop that's shown in blue, right? So you may notice that there's this loop, right, in blue. And you have three different tyrosine residues that are shown as being already phosphorylated. So it's autophosphorylated. Okay. And then it's shown with um, an analog of ATP that has a beta gamma imido group, which will basically hydrolyze, right? And that is shown right here in, the in a cleft between the N-terminal and C-terminal domain. Well, once the tyrosine residues within that protein tyrosine kinase are within the receptor are phosphorylated, the protein or the receptor undergoes a conformational change that allows for ATP to bind, and that allows for the substrate protein to interact in close proximity. So it actually shows you right here um, a tyrosine residue within an orange showing you like a backbone or the segment of the protein substrate. and. A tyrosine that is in close proximity of um, the gamma phosphate within the ATP analog, right? So once it's autophosphorylated, 
it undergoes conformational change. Now there's the site for ATP to bind and for the protein substrate to interact um, in close proximity with ATP, in this case, ATP analog, which will end up being phosphorylated. Um, and then it will create an entire signaling cascade and that phosphorylated protein um, will basically transmit the signals, the extracellular signal into um, other signaling pathways. Okay, so now let's take a look. Okay, the activated loop is where the three different tyrosine residues are that are phosphorylated. It has three different phosphorylated tyrosine residues, and those are found within that activated loop. So if we take a now a look at the N-terminal part, right, well, it undergoes conformational changes that can be described as a 21-degree rotation relative to the C-terminus, right? So we're still looking at the N-terminal and C-terminal domain Right? But if you take a look at the C-terminal domain, we have the phosphorylated and the dephosphorylated um, receptor. Right? And we're looking at the activation loop that has the tyrosine residues that are phosphorylated. Right? In the phosphorylated form, which is shown in blue, versus the dephosphorylated form, which is shown um, in red, you could see the conformational change, and that con conformational change is necessary for both the ATP to interact and for the substrate protein. Okay. And then you could also notice the C-terminal domain doesn't really undergo much of a conformational change aside from the activation root loop, whereas in the N-terminal domain, there's quite a bit of um, conformational change that is taking place and that's really the 21 degree ro rotation relative to the C terminal lobe. Alright, so in summary, in receptor tyrosine kinases you have a ligand that binds to a receptor protein. When the ligand binds to the receptor, it will trigger dimerization of the receptor. And then that particular receptor has a protein tyrosine kinase activity within um, its cytoplasmic end, right? It's going to autophosphorylate. Once it is autophosphorylated, it can then phosphorylate other tyrosine um, residues within protein substrates, right? So it has a protein, it's a protein tyrosine kinase. Okay, I hope this was helpful and I will see you next time.